let's move now to the third. Uh, we are running slightly late on time, so I will be a bit fast on the on the on the next presentation. So the the third speaker of tonight or this morning or this afternoon's uh, session is Pablo Sender. Uh, Dr. Pablo Sender is an architect and urban designer. is an associate professor at the Bartlett School of Planning, UCL. He combines his academic career with professional work through his own urban design practice, uh, Lugadero, which focuses on facilitating co-design processes with communities. At UCL, he is the director of the Master in Urban Design and City Planning Program and the coordinator of the Civic Design CPD. He has carried out uh, action research projects in collaboration with activists and communities. His work with communities can be assessed in community-led regeneration platform. He is co-author of Designing Disorder with Richard Sennett, which has been translated into seven languages, co-author of the Community-Led Re Regeneration with uh, Daniel uh, Fitzpatrick, and co-editor of Civic Practices with Maria João Pita and Civic Wise. He is part of the City Collective for this journal City. Uh, Pablo, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nuno, for introducing me. And also, thank you to the organization of the placemaking um, Great Bay area for inviting me to, uh, to this um, event. Let me share my screen just a second. Uh, also quit the you know yeah okay uh, uh slideshow play from the start can you see my screen yeah and can you see the slides passing passing yeah yeah okay um so i'm going to speak um mainly about the my recent book designing disorders since i wanted to speak today about how to design for uncertainty uh, but I'm not going to speak just about the book, but also about some of the motivations that led me um, to write this book with, with Richard Sennett and, and also what has come out uh, after it and, and the, the different works related that I've done uh, to this book that I think that are relevant for, for this uh, panel. Um, so I first read the uses of disorder when I was 21, so 25, sorry, when I was 25, the same age as Richard when he wrote the book. I was an urban design master's student at the Bartlett in 2008, 2009. And this is how the Bartlett looked like by, by then. I don't know how many of you know the, the Bartlett, but now it's kind of like a more shiny building. Matthew was showing before, kind of like a, a little plaque on the, on the, on the facade. Uh, this was called Waste House. It, it was, uh, um, an old building that was a melting pot of creativity where you could find uh, spray paint and wrecks of models in the corridors uh, as well as ongoing design crits except the fourth floor that was a planning department and it was a bit more tidy and um, and this environment was very influential in in developing some of the ideas of the book it, it was 2009 um, when the crisis of capitalism and the economic recession uh, uh, were bringing a period of uncertainty and also an opportunity for social movements like the 15M in Spain or the Occupy movement in the US. I saw many connections between the situation Richard described in his book, which was uh, written in, in 1970 in the context of the New Left and the, the 1968 movement and so on, and the present, both in the sociopolitical situation and in uh, urban planning. 50 years after the book was published, regeneration schemes still seek to remove unwanted behavior and tend to domesticate informality. In the 1960s, it was uh, flyover highways uh, and all those single function modernist developments like big housing schemes and so on, the ones that imposed order. But currently there are global, I mean, the, the orders are imposed by more like a global um, financial market by real estate led developments such as Hudson Yards in New York, which you can see there in the picture, which is uh, one of these kind of like privately owned public spaces, uh, or the demolition and redevelopment of council estates in London, the pre replacing them with higher income homes and causing the displacement of many of these residents. So there, there are orders imposed um, uh, by urban planning, but uh, in the 60s it was more the estate 
uh, and and now it's more kind of like global financial market. The one that we ordered. Um, so the validity of the book's arguments 50 years later made me question: Can architects and planners design disorder? Um, but what do we mean by disorder? And this is something important to understand. Uh, because Richard and I, we don't mean uh, disorder forms like in postmodernism, which in a way, just what did is was replacing more order forms by more funky shapes. This is not what we mean. Uh, what we mean is the contestation of imposed orders and also creating conditions for the unplanned. This is an example of, of this um, also the, the, the comparison between the orders imposed in 1960s uh, and, and today in the book I explore this through the case of, of the Westway, of activism along the Westway, which is a motorway al uh, along North Kensington in London. In the 1960s the imposed orders was the construction of the, of the highway that would cut the neighbourhood in two and destroy many houses, but currently the imposed order are the gentrification and the disposal of the community act, um, assets that the community is resisting. And, and, this, uh, and this is two situations, the construction of urban motorways in the 60s and the gentrification processes and real urbanism today illustrate the kinds of order that the proposals in, in this book aim to contest. Uh, and in both periods, activism contested creatively to the imposed orders through community-led actions such as self-built uh, adventure playgrounds that they built under the flyover or through the occupation of spaces as a social infrastructure um, uh, also under the highway now, 50 years later, uh, creating deregulated spaces like the one uh, Richard speaks uh, in his 1970 book. So how do we take these local actions, uh, these more activist mm, dimension proposals to, from the local actions to the city-wide scale? Um, because sometimes, uh, sometimes when Richard and I have even talked together, people ask us if, if we can scale up, if we can scale this up. Uh, and what we say is that rather than scaling up, we have to do proposals that work together as networks. So we propose networks and municipalism. And uh, what we propose in the books is how the anarchic city could work through networks and municipalism. Uh, in the anarchic city, grassroots initiatives should be encouraged and supported. And these grassroots initiatives uh, would be independent from each other. They, they operate independently. They have their own forms of decision making and democratic processes, but they are in a network and exchange knowledge and resources with other initiatives. Network is the opposite of scaling up. If we scale up the infrastructures for disorder that we propose in the book, uh, stop contesting orders and power start to be concentrated in the hands of a few. Uh, in a network, the initiatives work independently in small scale, back connected. And in London, we saw networks of initiatives in squatting and housing cooperative movements in the 1970s, like we see here the case of Bristonia, also near the Westway. And today we can see networks of grassroots initiatives like Just Space, which is a, a network of community initiatives that I've worked with in London quite a lot, um, and, uh, and which bring different voices from different communities across London uh, together. And the role of the municipality is to support and encourage those initiatives and also to ensure that the resources are distributed equally and that no one's left behind. Um, and they need the networks to hold them into account. Ada Colau, who is in the picture, mayor of Barcelona since 2015, she used to be a, a housing activist and become mayor through a citizen platform in 2015 and, and renewed her mayorship in 2019, recognizes the importance of social movements uh, in all the achievement that she, she and her administration has, has, has uh, achieved um, in the local authority because they say that, that the social movement have lobbied and have influenced many of, of her decisions. Uh, and as an architect and urban designer, I wanted to put these ideas into drawings and words, uh, take them from the paper to the plan, which is the title of one of the chapters of the book. So I started to experiment with urban design interventions uh, that could create the kinds of disorder that Richard discussed in, in his book. And regulated public spaces where people can learn to tolerate difference, which encourage social interaction and the emergence of unplanned activities. But I soon faced a uh, contradiction. How can we design disorder if design itself um, uh, tends to introduce order in the, in the urban space? 
So my response to this contradiction was to start with the infrastructure. And that's why I titled this part of the book, Infrastructures for Disorder, because the infrastructures can create conditions and provide possibilities. So this concept of infrastructure for disorder uh, are defined as in initial interventions that create conditions for unplanned use of the public realm, which are points of departure for a continuous and open process. And these strategies are presented in four chapters, uh, which I'm going to explain very briefly because we have no time. Uh, I'm having some breakout, some background noise. Uh, so in four chapters, which are below, above, disorder in section uh, process. Yeah. I don't know if you can mute the, the other. Uh, um, so what the strategies aim, the infrastructure for this are, uh, the aim, is to turn what Richard Senes called a closed city, a city that has not the capacity to evolve and mutate into an open city. Uh, which which can adapt and is flexible and where uh, unpredictable things can happen because in the in the closed city the functions are predetermined. Um, so the infrastructure for below are affects um, uh, a first set of strategies to turn the city that works as a closed system into an open system um, through reassembling the infrastructure, both the physical infrastructure and uh, the social infrastructure and rearranging re its elements to make it more visible, accessibly, accessible and open, to make it collectively manage, uh, because collectively managed infrastructure can provoke collective awareness, negotiations, corporations, uh, relationships of solidarity and social interaction, uh, can create disruptions that provoke these negotiations, and we have the capacity to grow, adapt, change and be upgraded. So I'm going to speak about how the infrastructure is, works as an assemblage, through the case study of Gillette Square, that actually I first met, I don't know if Hans might recall, but I first met in, uh, in uh, I first came into contact with this case study in an event uh, organized by Steeple in London in 2011, that is called Inspire in London. Uh, and uh, and it, was, it was very interesting, uh, this case, and actually inspired me uh, um, to, to write a long part of the thesis and also of this, of this book. Uh, because Gila Square uh, today is kind of like a very vibrant square with people from a lot of different cultures um, come together uh, and, uh, and, and that, that welcomes everyone. And, but it, it wasn't always like that. It used to be a car park, as you can see in this following picture. And it was the a first action of rearranging the elements in the car park by placing this kiosk uh, designed by Hawkins Brown, some architects here in London. Uh, they designed this, uh, they put this kiosk along the car park and this very action of putting this kiosk and having them uh, with rents, very, very low rents, uh, uh, triggered that the Afro-Caribbean community started, getting, uh, started taking their businesses in these um, in this kiosk, very varied businesses that went from uh, uh, an independent radio station, a little cafe, and, and other businesses. So the Afro Caribbean community started to congregate around this kiosk before it was a square. Now it was being built in the early 2000s, but it was uh, they started um, congregating and they created the necessity of it, of it becoming a square. So this rearrangement of the public space pro uh, provokes. A public space that is very inclusive. Uh, there, there's kind of like people that are around uh, drinking and, and playing reggae music, uh, um, a jazz club below the half kind of like free jam sessions that anyone can turn and play in the ground floor or more ticketed sessions in the upper floor, other restaurant bar with jazz as well where you go and you can have whatever you want of meal and you pay what you want. Um, so you, so you, there, there are no fixed prices, but you pay what you want. All these kiosks around here, um, which are mainly by Afro-Caribbean businesses, uh, I don't know, youth facilities, and most importantly, it works as an open system. It works as an open system because it has this kiosk, uh, sorry, this, this kiosk, this uh, containers that you see here that were done later by other architects, which is something very interesting. They were done by math architecture art. Uh, and uh, where they have different kind of elements inside here, such as this um, um, 
um, market stalls, uh, table tennis, uh, cinema, play equipment. So the square is continuously rearranged. Actually, in this case, I mean, what I found interesting also, um, coming back to some of the Matthews lecture, this case is actually privately managed. It's privately managed by Hackney Cooperative Development, which is a cooperative, which is non-for-profit. But it, I think that makes a huge difference because it's not that, because since it's a cooperative community run that is non-for-profit, they've included kind of like the Afro-Caribbean community, the different minorities that are in the area, and everyone has a place in it. Whereas if you look at other places, for example, the one near the GLA, uh, which is more London, which is a Kuwaiti um, sovereign fund that owns uh, more London, it's a completely different because the, the interest of a Kuwaiti investment fund is making profit, it's not the local community. So I think that, that there's also a huge difference between which private owner has a space. Just to add some things that may, maybe we can comment on that on the, on the debate. Um, but I think this, these ideas that, that I explain in Gillette Square are very relevant to, to the other uh, parts of the process that I'm going to explain very, very quickly. Uh, the, the, the ones above the next chapter, the, the strategies above explores the interactions um, uh, that take place above the ground as a result of the infrastructure provision, uh, explore how to turn the public space into a flexible space, like in Gillette Square, that can be modified, where different elements can be added, and where different areas of the surface have diverse type of infrastructure and foundations to plug in structural elements. So each part of the public space have different qualities, capacities, and provides different possibilities. And then the disordering section looks at how to turn uh, the city that works into a, as a closed system to an open system through first uh, the longitudinal section by eliminating divisions, uh, eliminating turning a fragmented space into a continuous space, creating a narrative of experiences. And these experiences can be created through generating different kinds of situations, provoking small disruptions. Um, uh, and disruptions that can be looking more detail in the cross section, uh, which consists of introducing different elements uh, that disrupt the current segregated spaces uh, and building light structures uh, and construction that have the capacity to grow. And I've been actually working recently with some communities in London in a, in a housing estate uh, where we're trying some of these uh, ideas on how to add lighter structures to, to the state, to add new uses and new activities. Finally, just kind of like reaching the, the end of the presentation, um, uh, uh, there's the chapter uh, process and flux, and this chapter explains the process to build infrastructures for disorder uh, and through various steps. First is looking at the existing uh, social infrastructure, because if we try to introduce the infrastructure for this order without looking at what is there, we might be again imposing order. And this is an example of Granville Community Kitchen, a social enterprise located in a community building in the London Borough of Brent. Before the pandemic, they provided free dinners every Friday to residents and whoever would come up. The atmosphere in this dinner was not of, of a food aid. Uh, it was uh, a weekly social gathering uh, for the state residents, for anyone who would show up. And at the same time, the organization has been resisting the redevelopment um, of the building for, for years, uh, which would increase the amount, um, uh, sorry, which would decrease. The, um, uh, basically, they were kind of like demolishing half of the community building and building um, housing blocks on top. Uh, and this would kind of like could jeopardize this kind of social infrastructure. Uh, which during the pandemic has been providing food for more than a thousand household a week. Um, so this type of process need to this type of process need to be valued and taken into account. Um, and then, in addition of looking at the system infrastructure, you need to provide new social and physical infrastructure. Uh, I had to have just kind of like an example here of uh, creating kind of like some initiatives in London that have created cooperative energy companies. And through creating these cooperative energy companies, they also create social interaction between neighbors because they start to kind of like start negotiations about how they use the energy, what they use it for, and so on. Finally, the last part of the book looks at designing for uncertainty as part of the process. 
Uh, so the strategies explained on this book have unpredictable outputs, and we need to see uh, these unpredictable outputs as something positive. For our work as architects and planners, when we work with local authorities and communities, it's important to acknowledge this uncertainty and make it part of the process. And this is the example of Play Wimbledon, a project I developed with my practice uh, Lugadero and for the, for the London Borough of Merchant. And our proposal, which won the competition, um, an ideas competition, uh, rather than proposing a master plan, as the, as the competition was asking for, we proposed a co-design process of how uh, th that, that would ask people through play activities how they wanted the town certain to be, uh, and, and which would lead to a collaborative design of public spaces. Uh, uh, so I think that also the local authority made kind of like a brave uh, decision on, on kind of like giving the competition to someone that was not proposing a master plan, but a co-design process. Uh, but designing for uncertainty is kind of like designing these kind of processes where you don't know the final output. Uh, and to conclude, designing for uncertainty means uh, understanding that uh, the infrastructures for disorder work as an open system and they are, therefore they won't reach a state of, of equilibrium they will be constantly changing and i'll leave it here thank you pablo uh, it's uh, looking at at uh, many of the cities where we go the things that we like are really unpredictable things so as urban designers as architects to, to try to be able to participate on generating these opportunities is, is quite an interesting and uh, not so common exercise. So thank you for your presentation. So we are 